Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ost, and welcome to the Friday Community Gathering from True Theater Resources Unlimited. Uh, we're a, an art service organization, in case you're new to us. Um, we basically uh, support and educate and, and help um, people understand the business of theater, and in particular, we like to help producers, because in case you don't know it, nothing much happens in theater without producers, um, so we need them. Um, so we do our best to actually support them and nurture new ones and, and create producers who actually will do a good job and get that work out there so that we can all see the work of all the artists in our community. Um, started doing this Friday thing, this Friday thing, this community gathering um, back in 2020 as a response to COVID. Uh, I, I know COVID seems like it's in the past, but it's not. <laughs> People still get COVID, by the way, just just so you know. Um, but we're we're no longer quarantined, and we're no longer as, as much danger for the most part as we used to be because of that little virus. Um, by way of just reminding you to even even if you're fully vaccinated, which I hope you are. Uh, and even if you don't think you're particularly vulnerable to it, there may be people around you who are. So be considerate and be be mindful uh, and conscious. Um, so we started off having these conversations on Fridays at, uh, at actually at five o'clock. But now we're doing them at five thirty um, because we, we didn't know what else to do with ourselves. Um, <clears throat> we we were all in isolation. We weren't able to function like we had normal, the normal life that we'd been used to, well, as normal as some of us ever had. And uh, we uh, decided to come together and talk about what we were going through. And while we were talking about what we we're going through, thought we'd be some do something a little uh, constructive and positive and also talk about ways to be creative and ways to ways to survive creatively during a quarantine. Um, that's That stopped, uh, those kind of conversations are kind of in the past. Uh, we've come out into the world. We have something that resembles a, a world of live performance again. Um, I say this I, just because my conscience tells me I have to. We, we're we acting as if we're in a new normal. Uh, we're acting as if live performance is back. Sure, it is, and a lot of people go to the theater, but it's not back to the extent that we need it to be back. Um, we will be seeing a lot of plays coming into New York now, and we're going to see a lot of plays not not be able to make it either until we get those audiences back. So if you're out there looking at us, watching this, and, and you're a theater lover, love it enough to go see a show. So uh, that that's that's my little soapbox for, for today. Um, we're having conversations that deal with lots of, of different areas of theater and community and, and the arts. And today we're doing something we haven't done before. Um, not that I wouldn't didn't want to, or not that I just I hadn't even thought of it. But um, we have a guest coming in today. He's a little bit of an unsung hero. Actually, is being sung now. Uh, he, sung seems to be the right word since he did a lot of work in Sing Sing. Um, so we're going to meet Brett Buell in a minute. We're going to talk about um, his work bringing bringing art into prisons. Um, we had a conversation with the room earlier. We talked about. The fact that we're going to be focusing on theater today, but and we probably will be, but bringing art in general um, to to uh, incarcerated uh, men and women has uh, has a lot of benefit, and um, I want to talk about it in as broad a way as possible, while at the same time giving Brent an op an opportunity to be very specific about his own experiences. Um, so I'm going to bring him in right now, and. Um, Brent, hi. <laughs> welcome to true. Welcome to the the Friday community gathering. Hello. Glad to be here. So I want to I want to give you a, a little. I want you to give a little background about yourself. I want to talk about you and your and your work in prisons before we move to the the big news that you're that you're having right now with a, a sure a movie. I'm I'm not going to make it a secret, guys. If you're out there. If you saw Rustin, you know who Coleman Domingo is. If you saw Scar uh, Scarsboro Boys, wasn't he in that too? I mean, he's he's done film, he's done theater. Um, Coleman Domingo is one of uh, the great actors that we have in the business, and he's in a movie that's about rent. And how many people can say that there's a movie about me that stars Coleman Domingo? 
<laughs> you can say that, can't you? Uh, it's a pretty great thing. It's a yeah. very great thing. So I, I, I'm i high for you. And uh, I've known Brent for a long time. Uh, Brent has, has been a friend of True for at least 20 years, maybe longer. And... Uh, <laughs> We've actually done we've done we've done parties in his apart in his loft apartment uh, <clears throat> once upon a time. Remember those? I and certainly he, do. And he's been part of our producer development and mentorship program. And um, tell us how you got involved and where the idea came to you about bringing art and bringing theater specifically into prisons. Sure. Um, first of all, Peru uh, was a very important part of this because the the mentorship that I got in, I had always, I'd been a director, I had not produced. And so as I began uh, my work with True and and studying with True, um, I met so many people, uh, Cheryl Weisenfeld, um, Jane Dubin, many people that I became working partners with, which I'm very grateful for, and for the leadership of Bob and, and Gary and all they've done to help mentor people. Um, well, I want to thank you for that. I also want to tell you that Jane is here today, but Cheryl Weisenfeld called me and specifically let me wanted me to let you know that she really wanted to be here to, to see you today. Uh, and then she had other things going on. Life happens. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I'm sorry she can't be. Um, so in terms of that, at the, at the time, all the same time that I began working with True, I was working with Reverend Al Sharpton around issues of police brutality, um, the Amadou Diallo shooting and other things. And um, because of that, my wife and I ended up having a man who was homeless working with, living with us, working on a, a project to help homeless people lobby for their own interests. Got a call one night from the head of drama department at John Jay College asking him to come and speak there. And I'd become very, very interested in the subject of homelessness and incarceration. This woman told me that there was a program at Sing Sing, found out that I was a director, and she said, would you like to, would you like to volunteer with the program? And it was just like someone said, you know, here are the heaven's gates, and they opened. It was just the, the coolest thing to be able to say yes to that. So the hardest thing about it was getting permission to go into the prison. It's, it's harder to get in uh, as a... a person who has not done anything wrong, then I think it is the other way. But uh, yes, I got working with rehabilitation through the arts. And um, I'll tell you more about that. Um, and that's, is that Le Leslie, uh, who's with rehabilitation? I know she, uh, there's somebody from Rehab rehabilitation for the arts who wanted to be here today as well. And she's she also told me to, to, to say hello to you. Oh, um, nice. Okay, um, so that's how it started. I, I, I can I detour for a second. Um, weren't you involved with Unframed? Yes, so, developed it and uh, with Ayaba Iba Mendingo, and then we had we had started uh, doing performances of it. But then I joined True, and that is when we hooked up with Jane Dubin and uh, ended up doing it all over, ending up uh, winning a, awards down at the in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, playing all over New York, and finally had an off-Broadway run here. So it was very, it was great. Just great. And I, rem and I remember when, because you said John Jay, John, John, John Jay College has been like part of your, your the background of your life for, for quite a while now. It really has. We did performances there. Um, that was one of our first big performances and um, did another big performance there recently of a new play that I've written called The Gate. Uh, I wrote it with a man who was then incarcerated. He's now home um, and uh, had a wonderful, wonderful, full blown reading of it there. So, Okay, so let's let's turn to bringing arts into prisons what is the thinking behind that why did somebody wake up one day and say this would be a good thing to do it wasn't necessarily you but i know it's it, did, did you know lani sepoy oh yes of course 
yeah, she's not with us anymore, but I know that she was dedicated to also bringing right. uh, art, art to the incarcerated. Um, the, this particular program was actually started by the men uh, in the prison that were writers and they got together and they said, we should do a play. That led to needing to have outside um, uh, persons in, volunteers, and the program built from 1996, I started in 2001. And by that time, they had realized that just, and this is so beautiful, it's not drama therapy. It's just the fact of getting together and doing the show that makes the difference in people's lives. Because I, putting together a show is like a microcosm of the world. You have all the different things that men in prison have, most of them never been experienced. They've never seen a live show and certainly have never been on stage. So many of them, they have not had any background in the arts. And they, beginning with just the simple act of reading a play and finding out that it looks different on a page than reading a book and getting interested in that, um, great stories about that and suddenly wanting to read more. The matter of stepping into a character that is not yourself, having to think about their motivations, what their life is like, how they see, is a first step in empathy. And if a person has empathy, they're not going to hurt another person. They're not going to rob another person. And it's a beginning of change for men. And I, I watched these men, most of them doing 25 to life sentences, saying, I, I started doing this character and, and he was doing this thing and I didn't like it. And then I realized it's something that I do. And I got to change that. And simple things like taking orders from someone and the, the, the change in a person in being able to hear that there is a directive being given to them that's to make them better rather than just to order them around is like such liberation for them. And I, I, I watch, so I will tell you, this is a, a very simple thing. Nationally, for people that have been in prison, within three years, over 60% end up back in prison. In this program with hundreds of people coming through and remaining part of it, we're under 3% ever returning to prison. It's just a remarkable uh, thing. And it is because theater by its very nature makes a person more interested in the world around them. So they've done studies to show that the men who become involved in the theater program also go on to sign up for college classes or finish their GED or whatever it happens to be. They get interested in things and Breaking the cycle of boredom in prison is really a big thing. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So the people, the people who come into the into the program, are probably the most willing to to look at things and and and, and maybe do something different. Um, have you ever had any men who have come into the program that were highly resistant to it and really a challenge to to get through to? I'm so glad you asked that, Bob. Um, one of the things that we were very grateful for was we did, people very often think you must have had the cream of the crop and that's why they don't end back in prison. The steering committee, which was five prisoners in the, the group, uh, was who determined who came into the program. And they determined by need, this guy really needs this program, not, oh, he'd be a great actor. And I would frequently get a call from the superintendent going, you realize you just let the most dangerous man in Sing Sing into your program. I hope to God you know what you're doing. And I'd say, he'll be fine. And it, it was just that way. The guys would come into the program. You might have someone who had so many rough edges. And I can tell you, this is a little, a, a little um, preview of what we're gonna talk about later. The star of the movie, Sing Sing, who co-stars with Coleman Domingo is Clarence Divine Eye Macklin. And Clarence Macklin 
came into the program, uh, was had never been on stage before, and was by one of my you know from day one was one of my uh, students and in the theater program, and he was, yeah, he was rough around the edges. He was he was something people were afraid of him. And of course, I found out later that he was always carrying a shank in his belt and prepared for uh, any kind of fight necessary. But the way that man has changed is one of the beautiful things of this world. And when you see his performance and see the depth of creativity and the beauty of his ability to embody a character, um, you're gonna be very impressed. Um, there's a lot of Oscar buzz around him already. So, wow. yeah, th people change. I mean, and it's one of the things, I mean, one of the things that um, I know we always would talk about was how theater changes people. I hadn't thought about it in terms of huge life change. I had thought about it in change of thought about subjects, but we're watching people change who they are and that the beginning with some of the most terrible things, some of the most terrible mistakes that a person can make in life, mm -hmm. to bring that all the way around full circle, look at it, take responsibility for it, and then change their motivation and what they're doing. It, it's the power of theater. And it's why I love theater so much. I just feel we underestimate, even those of us who have loved it so much, underestimate how much it can do. Well, one of the chief uh, components of theater is, is is behavior, human behavior. I mean, more more so than than other the, the other arts. This is what the heart and soul of theater is: character, is who you are and what you do. Um, so I can I, I I see that easily being a very good uh, te teaching method. Um, but I I, ha I do have to ask you this: Yeah, have have there have there ever been people that just didn't didn't do it? That just didn't they didn't get it? They never, they never came around. Yeah, there. I, I mean, it. It's not. It's not a magic wand. It's. It's a person has to want to change eventually. They may not the first time they come, but they eventually, if they're going to stick with it, you. There's something that has to happen. So there have been people that have come into the program and stopped. Um, that is. That is simply the case, but it it was not, it was not the vast majority of people. People came in and fell in love with doing theater. It was like the greatest release they had had. And uh, prison is an experience in monotony. It is a dark place. And to have this where they got to be someone else and to express themselves in such big ways. I remember one man he was massive. He was the chief bodybuilder of, of Sing Sing. And he we did um, the play Slam. And he played Hoffa, uh, the prison, like the guy, that the prisoner that runs the prison. And at the end, we had a party for everybody. And he stood up and he was such a hard guy. You couldn't you didn't feel he'd ever have emotion. And I remember he started to cry and he said, I did something I'm proud of for the first time in my life. And he said, I know that they tell you when they come in here that we're just animals and don't get acquainted with us and don't tell us anything about yourselves. But he says, you guys come in here, you give us a hug, you tell us you love us. And he said, I just want to say thank you. And he just broke down. And then he turned around, <laughs> spun around, looked everybody in the eye, and he says, if any of you ever tell anybody what I just said, you know what's going to happen to you. So I'm taking my chances now and telling you. So how many times are you going to make me cry during this interview? <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, you can you can join me. I, I, it It's always, I'm right on the edge of it all the time with it, Bob. It's such a deep thing. Um. Do you have any, have I, I think somewhere along the line I heard that the the people that some of them write also, also do they ever write things that they perform? Absolutely, absolutely. And so how does that work? Well, Divine G Whitfield, 
uh, for instance, is was one of the member founding members of the group. He has written like seven novels uh, while he was incarcerated and many plays. And we did plays of his. One of them was called Fine Print. It was a very wonderful play about uh, the recording industry and this, um, I don't know, recording mogul who was a crooked guy who was taking advantage of everybody and how he got his comeuppance. And it was a great play. And that happens over and over again. We did uh, plays that were adaptations of other plays, like adaptations of movies that some of the men did scripts for. Stratford's Decision was written by one of the men. We did a lot that they wrote. I have a very silly question. Go ahead. Did they did they did they write by hand, pen and ink, or do, did they have access to computers? With, they are allowed they do now to have an electric typewriter that has a little bit of memory in it. Some of them can have like a 10 page memory. So they can work on something, then they have to print it out and clear the memory and start again. So but they, is, can't have, a... they can't have uh, computers or anything that's connected to the internet. They're completely cut off from the outside. Okay. But I was just, I the, the last time I wrote a play by hand on, with the, a pen, pen and, uh, and, and paper was I think, uh, when I was fourteen, so um, so they they that's amazing that they do that. So that yeah. they they're also perseverant. They're, they're they're dedicated and they they really have something to say. I gather. So, um, have you ever felt threatened? Was there ever a moment that you that you felt threatened? So, um, I mean, you talk about it so la di da. I mean, I I think I would be a little nervous going into prison. Do you know? I was. I was very nervous. That trip from my house to the subway used to terrify me. But in the prison, I was fine. Um, the I I just, I felt I'd come home. And I did not go to prison to make friends. That wasn't my idea. I went to prison to teach and make theater. I ended up making the best friends of my life there. And they remained so. The guys are here at our house all the time. Um, those that are home. Uh, it's it is really a, a remarkable thing that has occurred, and the the real relationships that have formed are are deep and lasting. In terms of of being afraid, um, I'll tell you one. Uh, the there were two guys. I had only been in the prison for a short time. I and uh, I've written a book about my ten years there, so watch for it uh, being published soon it's called sing sing backstage but um i had not gotten so well acquainted i i had met the guys in the program i had been there for maybe a couple of months two guys one of whom i vaguely remembered had something to do with our backstage crew came to me and said come with us and i i'm thinking well am i supposed to come? just someone says come with me am i supposed to do it or not anyway i they had already left and they were going over to a stairwell that led to the they're like catacombs beneath the theater okay they're going down there so i follow them and i'm thinking you know i'm probably not supposed to do this i don't know i'm not sure my heart's going thump 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 and we get down through these dark tunnels and they turn a corner and there's this big wood door and they open it and they go go in and i'm thinking i'm gonna die here but okay so I walked in into the room. They came into the room. They closed the door behind me. And it was dark. And it took a moment for my eyes to adjust. But when they did, on the table was laid out a whole lunch. And they said, we hope you don't mind us asking you down here. But we've been watching what you do. And we like it. And we were wondering what it might just be like to have a lunch with a friend. Would you break bread with us? Oh, wow. <laughs> One of the best lunches I had in my life. I never enjoyed a potato chip more. I told you, stop making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so do you do you think we should I let let's move let's move to the to the movie and um, okay. why don't we start by by I'll, I'll share the screen with everyone and. Um, We'll see a little hint, a little bit of the movie, right? Is Great. That okay with you? Yes, absolutely. This is 
This is A24 um, has acquired us, and uh, this is their the trailer for our movie. A24 is a company. Is it a distributor or? The distributor, okay. yeah. Okay. So here we go. Can you remind us of the name, please? To die. To sleep. To dream. Okay, what happened? Let's try this again. To die. To sleep. To dream. This is a clemency hearing for your conviction. 25 to life. Since you've been in custody, you've been involved in the theater program. All right, gentlemen, let's go. It's been a program that was established to help uh, people get more in touch with their feelings and it truly get some rehabilitation. I am Gladiator Goliath. I am Spartacus. I'm Prince Hamlet of Denmark. And it's turned into something of, I don't know, um, wonderful. What part do you play? From time to time, I do act, uh, like we all do. So are you acting at all during this interview? We here to become human again and enjoy the things that is not in our reality. I think you guys are becoming real with each other, vulnerable. Listen, I already know what you're doing, know who you are, what you're about, bro. What? You don't get to tell me what I need in prison. You don't get to do that. And don't bring me in those dark corners no more. The world expects brothers like you and I to walk in with our heads held down. Nah, what you gotta walk in like a king. Everything is yours. I'm divine now. Yeah, this is my theater. Now give us a brother, give us a brother. Go to your most perfect spot. Do you hear anything? Are you with somebody? Are you outside? Hold that feeling. Let's go! Yeah! You gotta admit that I murdered that Hamlet to me, bro. Shakespeare is in his grave right now. He rolled over. You did your thing, beloved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's great. Um, and for the, the the person who asked, the, the movie is called Sing Sing. And tell tell them who who plays you. Uh, Paul Racy, uh, Paul Racy, uh, known uh, he was Academy Award nominated for his role in the sound uh, the Sound of Metal, and uh, it, you see him there as the instructor playing me. And so what's it like seeing yourself being played played in a in a movie by somebody? You know, it was really at I was nervous about it because I felt like if if it isn't authentic, this is what I fought for the whole time for this. I wanted this movie to be really authentic to what it is. And I'm so grateful. Greg Quidar and Clint Bentley, who wrote the script and Greg, who directed, uh, really came through with something people have never seen before. Uh, I just read a review the other day. It said, this is a movie unlike anything you've ever seen um, because it is so authentic. It has none of the prison tropes. Um, it's the real thing. But to, to see, uh, know that someone was gonna play me, I was nervous. And then we got on set and here's Paul Racy. He's so beautiful. He read my whole book first and then so humble he would come and talk to me we're going to do this scene and how did that affect you did it make you angry did you laugh it off what happened watching him perform i was so proud of his performance and how he interacted with the men what you're going to see is what really happened um with me it's it is that it's that real and it, it's it's i'm i'm thrilled i just i i loved watching him perform you know, I think he used to. He used to a lot of, of admirers exercises. right now. 
I think you've won over the room at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess. <laughs> um, uh, Carol London, uh, can can you actually talk a little bit about what your experience is teaching art in maximum yeah. security prisons and how that relates to what, what Brent sa is saying? Yeah, I found that what he said echoes my experiences uh, to the T. I, I, um, I teach, well, first of all, I'm teaching through the local community college, which offers associate's degree programs to incarcerated people. So, and it's always in maximum security. It's in New Jersey. So I was, I'm now at my second time with the women's prison. There's one women's prison and I was at the men's prison in the fall. So we go, we do it by semesters. And um, I've found that, for instance, just the other day, my thoughts are racing because there's so much that I relate to what you say. Mm -hmm. So I walk in, they don't, the, the officers count every paintbrush I bring in. I'm not allowed to have sharpeners. And they count every paintbrush and in and out as they refer to them as shanks. Um, and um, and I brought in some fake flowers to paint that I got at Michael's tulips. And a woman who was not in the class said, thank you for bringing these in. We never get to see such beautiful colors in here. Yeah. And um, and most of my students too, I, I have, I haven't felt scared in the prison. And before when I was with the, I would, the women's prison is relatively small. It's a broken down facility that's, uh, it, it has sort of a, it has sort of a college campus, the falling apart college campus feel, except you go through gate after gate after gate. And the men's prison, I was at Northern State which is the one right on Newark. And that's known as the gang prison. And there are, you know, there was, there were about 2,700 men. And I had to walk about three quarters of a mile from once I got in and hearing the gates clang and clang and clang and till I was in the prison. But everywhere I went, I, I did, I, I never really, I never felt unsafe. I really felt that my students I so I have a, I, so Kara, I, I, have, I have a question. Men. I have a question for you. Um, so so mm -hmm. basically, the the your program consisted of um, oil painting, watercolors. No. What, what were the, what were the tools that they had to use? No, only for, it was first basic drawing one, and then two, which introduces color. But we're not allowed to have oil paints. We're not allowed to have acrylics. We're not allowed to have anything that's flammable. So not even uh, like. Um, Oil pastels are not allowed, can't have glue, can't have tape. So first it's, you know, charcoal, pencils, all kinds of all kinds of materials like that. And now we've graduated to because this is basic drawing too, which is which is um watercolors and pastels and things like that. But we colored okay, pencils. Well, okay, that's what I was curious about. So so I'm going I'm gonna come back to Brent because uh, I have a, a few more questions to ask him, but thanks for sharing that. And um, if I, I'm keeping an eye out for anybody else who's had, had similar experiences, because like, I, I wonder how people have a chance to, to also talk. Um, so I, I guess you've kind of answered some of the other questions I planned to ask. You, they were kind of built into, into your presentation. Um, but uh, tell me how the idea for the movie came about. We... Uh, in 2005, the men had said, we, you know, we, we love doing these shows, but we've done a lot of really heavy drama. Uh, and there's a lot of heavy drama that goes on in here all the time. Is there any chance we could do a comedy? And we had tried and tried and tried to find a comedy that had roles for 25 male uh actors and maybe two or three females because we're a pro one of the only programs in the country that has female actresses come in and do the shows and so we couldn't find anything and i was meeting with the guys and i could just see how much they wanted this and in a moment of 
insanity, I said, well, I'll, I'll write one for you. And so I immediately thought, oh my God, I just promised them I'd write them a, you know, a big comedy. And they'd had all kinds of ideas. One wanted to do a cowboy comedy and one wanted to do a, uh, a comedy about the Black Plague and wanted to do one about uh, Freddy Krueger and another one wanted to do something that was Egyptian, all kinds of stuff. And so I came home and over the weekend, I ended up writing this 140 page play and uh, called Breaking the Mummy's Code. And that is what we did. It is a wild time traveling thing about a young Egyptian prince that travels the world in time to find out who killed his mummy. And um, so Esquire magazine assigned a reporter to come into every rehearsal, John Richardson. And he was there for over six months as we rehearsed, great guy. And he ended up, Esquire got so excited about it, they sent in photographer too, and they ended up doing an eight page photo spread with the article about it called Sing Sing Follies. In 2016, like all those years later, from 2005, 2016, 11 years later, I got an email at midnight saying, we're Greg Quedar and Clint Bentley. Uh, we're intending to make a movie about your work. Please call us as your earliest convenience. It well, ended wait, up- wait, a sec wait a second. Um, so they, they can just decide they're gonna make a movie about your work. Were they calling you for permission? Uh, they were calling for information. They had no, already not permission. Okay. No, they yeah, they for permit. Yes, there, it was permission too. Um, okay. Obviously, it would have been a very different movie had they not had my participation. But um, it was so lovely, and we ended up working uh, for it was almost seven and a half years between the time that the script was begun and when we filmed. Um, and it's it was a great experience just seeing it developed. And I, I will say here again, thank you, True, and you raised an important question. Could they have done this without my permission? Uh, no. And uh, the minute that they said they wanted to um, acquire life rights and be able to tell this story and including background on it and everything. Uh, I called Michael Alden and I said, Michael, I need a lawyer. What, who do I call? And Michael immediately uh, told me who to call, which was the exact right person. I won't say now who it was. Oh, uh, I'd love to know who it was. Okay. Yeah. I'll be glad to tell you. And <laughs> um, it, it's just like, be, to be able to have a resource like that, that I could go to, who I knew personally could trust, because it was through true. Oh, just, um, just so everybody understands, Michael Alden, uh, there's there's two Michael. This is the, this is Michael Alden, the elder. Um, and he taught the producer development and mentorship program. So he was your, he was your, your, your teacher. He was my teacher. And he also, um, he did Broadway, but he also did film. And so he was very acquainted with both. And it was very uh, easy to be able to call him and, and find out what would be the best way to go on this. And everything that I had learned about producing theater came into play with this. I'm co-producer of the film. And everything that I learned about what you do and how you negotiate things and all came into play with this. So I'm very grateful for what I learned from True um, in preparation for this, even though the actual thing came not as something that I drummed up, it was came as a surprise in the middle of the night. At midnight, yet. Yeah, at, at midnight. midnight. I always check my email right before I go to bed like an idiot, you know? Who, who, who answers the phone at midnight and is told that somebody's like taking over your life? <laughs> you do. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, I also just wanted to mention, since we were talking about the film, one of the thrilling things about this movie, um, Coleman, Clarence Macklin, who you saw, the one saying, don't don't bring a guy in the corner. That's our Clarence Macklin, Divine Eye from Sing Sing, our program. Was he the one that uh, said uh, he was Hamlet? 
Yes. Okay. Hamlet is in is in Breaking the Mummy's Code too. Um, <laughs> of course but, he is. <laughs> yeah, but there are also sixteen of the men from the program who are now home who are also featured players in this movie. So it's just like an overwhelming thing to me. It was like having our our inside theater group together again as we were on set. And they were all here on Sunday. We had a great time um, just kind of reliving some of those moments and and well all. let me let me let me ask you did I follow this or, or not? Are you saying that some of the actual prisoners are in the movie? Yes. How many? Sixteen. Sixteen of the prisoners are in the movie. So former when they, prisoners. These when are these form, who, when, when these who, former prisoners decided that they were going to take a leap, or or they were recommended to go into your program, and they never, never thought they were going to be in a movie. That's insane. <laughs> Almost none of them were even thinking that they would. It was anything they'd pursue when they got out, but they fell so in love with it. And then when uh, Greg and Clint began talking about this movie, I started introducing them to all these men. They, we had many of the auditions right here in our loft. And because they would fly in from, um, they're based in Texas and they would fly in for auditions and we'd have them here in the loft. And then eventually we had uh, more uh, by Zoom. And that's how the movie, the primary characters of the movie were cast. So tell me, what do you do when you're not changing lives? <laughs> I write. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, just, I just finished this book, um, Sing Sing Backstage. And uh, my next is a novel. But um, yeah, I had a break during, I, I wrote it during COVID. And that was a, a, a great time to do it. I didn't, wasn't obviously doing any theater during that time. And we were working on the film. The film was shot under strict COVID protocol. I mean, we were all masked and tested every day and everything and did the oh entire so shoot it's, without it, it, one it's not, a mir it's not a miracle enough. So, so this whole thing is not miracle enough, but you actually <laughs> right. shot it during COVID. We shot it during COVID. We shot you it. You just don't, you don't do anything the easy way, do you? No, I don't. 2022, we were, it was right at the, right at the end of the worst of the pandemic. So everybody was, was vaccinated, but it was, it was really, uh, it was tough. Well, I'm trying to figure out what to do about my screen because my screen is starting to break up. Um, well, I guess I'm just going to. You seem bit. okay from here. Uh, you don't see the green blotches on the sides of my screen. Oh, I do a little. It's the I light. Thought, the lighting. So, something changed in the lighting in here. Huh. So I don't know what I'm going to do now. But all right, it is what it is. Um, what I can do is I can keep you on screen and keep off screen. Oh <laughs> uh, well. Um, so the other thing that I, I I actually never got to ask you, which I think a lot of people, well, first of all, everybody's asking. Well, so people are asking. When can they see it? Where can they see it? And All if right. I understand, it's not really for official release until July, is it? Right. We had our our world premiere was at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, we were at the Royal Alexandria Theatre the first night of the festival, one of the featured events. Um, and that was, was great. It was through that that we were acquired by A24. We were one of the there were over 200 films in the festival, and we were one of the ones that was acquired um, by that great company. Couldn't get better. We just had our U.S. premiere in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. And um, there we won the audience award, the audience favorite award of the festival, which I'm really proud of. And uh, then the theatrical release will be on July 12th. And it'll be opening in Los Angeles and New York first, and then uh, in theaters across the country. Do you have any idea where where it's going to open in New York? I don't. I actually don't. There's going to be there's going to be a big premiere, uh, a really big premiere uh, here in New York, but we don't know the location yet. I think A twenty four knows, but they haven't told us yet. Okay, so. 
the other thing <clears throat> that we haven't we haven't touched on this this all is so matter of fact to you because you like you've just lived through this right and I, I, I know I am just like going oh my god that's a, that's one miracle after another just like this is crazy this this whole thing is <laughs> I this agree, whole story just amazing <laughs> just amazing how did who reached out and, and knew Coleman Domingo how did you get a star for this um that came through Greg and Clint. Um, they have a very good track records uh, up from Ashes, Transpicos, um, and uh, uh, Jockey are three of their movies. And Coleman had this little window of time and uh, fell in love with the script. And he said, I've got to do this. And so it was all built around his schedule and his company, Edith Productions came on board with us. Uh, Black Bear Pictures came on board with us uh, in terms of financing. And um, it it just all came together. And, and uh, I'll tell you another thing to watch for, uh, Bryce Desner, um, who was with uh, the national is the composer of the music. And there's going to be an album of the music. It's just incredible. And yeah, everything, end, and everything is, is identified as Sing Sing. Is that, that's the brand Sing Sing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, it was recorded by the um, London contemporary orchestra and recorded in Abbey road. <laughs> so the Beatles studio is where our music was recorded which is just so does, so does, anything ever, cool. does anything ever go wrong for you in life? <laughs> oh, I, I tell you, this is so cool. And then at the end of the movie, you're going to hear a song. We had, we'd hoped to find a, a song for this very important ending of the movie and had looked at various things, the black Pumas, um, the national other people. And there were songs that we liked but they didn't just seem right. They had been used in other films. Some said, have you heard of this new singer, Abraham Alexander? And they hadn't. And they said, well, let's, um, let's send him a script and see what, if we can talk to him. So he came on and they had chosen one of his songs they thought might be right for the movie. And he, they said, you know, he said, well, I love this movie. And, and they said, um, uh, we'd like to we'd like to license this particular song, and he went, mm, that could work. But I love this movie so much. Why don't I just write a special song for it? Which he did, and wait till you hear it. It's it is the movie that ends it ends the movie, and it's just so beautiful. And then at the then following that, you will actually see some of the original video that I shot in Sing Sing of our production of Breaking the Mummy's Code. So you actually see some of that original video at the very end of the movie. So let's go, to, let's, let's, you know, we're a, we're a business organization, you know, we're yeah. a producer's organization. You said that you were, you were brought on as a, as a co-producer or associate producer, some form of producer. Tell us more about that. What was your relationship with a, with a movie from a business point of view? Um, the contractually, um, the life rights, and then this is where this differs from anything that I have been able to do before. This movie was made on a completely new basis, which was everyone from the star to the grips was paid the same but everybody owns the movie based on time is the only difference. So this was the first, this is the first, if you want to say it, worker owned movie um, that we know of. There have been some other attempts to do it, but this is the most thoroughly egalitarian movie. Hats off to Coleman. He wanted to do it this way. Oh, um, so that's that was my question. Who led who led this this whole movement? It was, uh, it was Greg Coleman? and Clint. Greg and Clint led it, and but but Coleman was on board. And some of you may know, I I 
there was a show that I was producing, going to produce in New York, where I wanted this as being the structure. I won't mention who, but it was a it was a big play, and um, we had everybody on board, including Woody King, um, but there were some people that wouldn't come on in that way. And that stopped the whole thing because it has to be everybody agrees to this uh, in order to do it that way. So it's um, it's beautiful that it happened that way. And it is going to, because the film is taking off, uh, it is going to benefit all these men that are, are in it, my former students, and all of us will share in, in what happens. Sounds like you're the one good thing that happened to a whole lot of people. Oh, thank you, Bob. I, I'll tell you, my experiences in in teaching in prison are the deepest, most beautiful experiences, most rewarding experiences of my life. And some of these men come and say, you know, you changed my life and I'm so grateful to you. And I, I say, you know, I, I'm the one whose life was benefited i'm the one who who gained so much because it was just like this amazing experience to go in and meet these people and watch what happened you know we we all hope to to leave something good behind and this was just like so remarkable so remarkable i'm very very grateful for it well, bless your heart. It's, uh, and I mean, I mean that in the northern way, not the southern way. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> so God bless. Um, I want to invite uh, people in the room to to uh, ask questions or or say anything. You know how how this meeting affected you, if it has affected you at all. Um, so one of them, Judith Bynes, uh, mentioned Kurt Toflin, who's a good friend of mine who runs Shakespeare Behind Bars. Um, that's very interesting to me. So, Judith, what, what did you what were you mentioning about about Kurt? You, you're you're on screen, but you're but you're muted. The more important thing was the unmute. Right. Um, should, I, uh, should I take myself off screen? No. Nope. Now that you're here, stay with us. All right. Um, uh, he was married to a uh, dear friend since we were kids, Marsha Tarbus. Hmm. Um, and he ran the Kentucky Shakespeare Festival for many years. And he just, he started this program, I probably the same way you did. Uh, it just sort of, he had read a book, I think. I can't remember, but somebody had written, no, somebody had written a book and uh, about a program that they were doing or thinking about doing. And he brought it to fruition. I, I can't remember the exact genesis but it was 1996 and then right and then he moved to michigan and um he turned it over to the guy who was working with him at, Sha at shakespeare festival and uh all i know is the last thing i saw listed was 2019 programs but now the, was 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 Brent Brent's program similar to what you were in, involved in? I know you came in, you brought plays into prisons, but the, were, were the prisoners actually um, in, involved in in the productions? No, no. I just had that one electrician. Uh, the, the one electrician. A murderer. Um, uh, well, but, I think. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not sure. No, if it was, were any of the were any of the people that you worked with. Convicted murderers? No, it was a company. No, no, no. This is to Brent. This is to Brent. You, you know, they were human beings who had made mistakes. They were serving 25 to life sentences, uh, primarily. Um, and I never, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. I feel that we've all had a low moment in our lives. And if if I was known for my lowest moment, and always referred to in that way, I would be very unhappy. And many of the men, you know, came to me and I remember one man, Cornell Alston came to me and he said, Brent, he said, you know, we're becoming friends, but I don't want you to be friends with who you think I am. I want you to be friends with who I am. So I have something I have to tell you. And he told me about why he was in prison. 
I would never ask, but he he wanted to tell me. And that's been true of, of many of the people. But the um, I never I never see a person and think, oh, that's so and so, the such and such. It it just isn't like that. They're 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 people of deep experiences who've had to look more more searchingly at themselves than practically anybody that I know. Well, thank you for that. Um, sure. Any anyone else in in the room want to join the conversation? Or I'm going to wrap up now. Should or should I, guys? I think there was something else I wanted to ask you, though. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you said that 16 of the of the um, of the men that you worked with in prison were in the film. Uh, these were people that were that were paroled or, or served. Yes. Their, their, okay. And did, did, did do you think being part of the, your program helped them um, achieve parole and, and make that progress out? I do, and this is uh, I'm glad you're asking this. Um, and someone mentioned uh, working with people uh, for how to present themselves or something. I think someone mentioned that earlier. Um, the one of the things I felt is when you go to parole you have like just a few minutes to say, this is who I am. And you're under questioning from a board of three uh, parole commissioners who are asking very unfriendly questions, as you heard in that. And are, that you acting, actually, are you acting now? That came from an actual transcript of Divine G. Whitfield, the, the man Coleman is playing actually was asked that in his thing are you acting now and the i had corrections officers come to me and go why in the hell are you coming in here to teach these guys so they can fool us better than they do now those same corrections officers two years later came to me and said you don't know how much these men have changed and how much easier you've made our lives um do, do you think we might be able to audition for some of these shows you know that's the kind of thing that happened. Do you have corrections uh, officers in your shows now? Not that I know of, um, but I think in terms of presentation, we did a we did a class called "Who I Who I Was, Who I Am, Who I Hope to Be," and it was a monologue class, and the men wrote three five minute monologues on those subjects, and it was directly to help them when they went to. Um, the parole board, because as you know, I mean, any actor knows when you get a character that's very close to who you are, that's the hardest character to portray. You don't, we don't know how to portray ourselves. And under heat of investigation, many of the men are, would just be uh, looking down or fumbling or stuttering. And so in a class, we said for the administration that this is a class to teach the men how to audition for a play. But it really was a class for him how to go to the parole board and be able to look people directly in the eye and present who they are uh, in a way without fear. So it's, yes, it's a great thing. Good. I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked that. I'm glad um, you did. So uh, Mila, did you want to ask something? Because I, I know you came into the room and I I uh, pulled you out and I'm uh, putting you back in. Thank you. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Mila. And um, I, my claim to fame with TRU is that I was there the night it was born. So but that's how long really? I know Bob. Yes. Cheryl Davis and I were having dinner with him and he he's he's such a genius. I can't tell you if he wanted me to scrub his feet, I'd scrub his feet. Oh, no. <laughs> <And it's... laughs> so the reason why I'm, I'm interrupting all of this grandeur uh, coming from me is that uh, I have known Keith David for most of my life. We went to Juilliard together and I put it in there. Perhaps you didn't see it. He is a brilliant actor. He's gotten lots of awards. He's he does film. He does television. He's um, someone who pays it forward with his faith, and so the, that's why the bottom, I want, the bottom line, Brent. She wants to know line, if you have any plans for bring for bringing this into with into with into theater. Whether you want to, ever going to do do this this movie, 
adapted as a as a, a work for theater because uh, he's also very highly respected he could help you with fundraising blah 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 you know the whole nine yard ten yeah yards. uh my wife did a show um some years ago with keith david so we had chance to get to know him lovely lovely gentleman um it, yeah actually there has been talk uh apparently at a24 about uh, doing Breaking the Mummy's Code as an on-stage musical. Uh, I don't know what stage that's in or what's happening or if I'm even supposed to say that, but um, that's Have what you ever hear. heard Keith sing? Yes. That's right. He and I did a show together. He's He rocks. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so let's so, try to get, so I'll try put to get back on topic. Information in there. I'll put my contact information. Well, no, this is for the, no, no not for me. This is for the show. I'm, I'm just putting it out there so Thank you can you so reconnect much. with Keith. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. And Arlene, did, Arlene, you've come into the room. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I want to say Brent Buell. I might have met you through True at first. I don't know, but I, I believe we did. It was from Donna Lamb, maybe, and then we yes. were both working. She was in my reparations video. The both of them. That's and right. I said, oh, and then when you mentioned True, I said maybe it was True. I mean, it was a long time ago. It had to be about twenty years ago. So, so you know. It was one place or the other. It just hit me today. Anyway, and and I love what you're doing, and it's just so inspiring to think. Uh, how about like with uh, drug addicts in in you know in in prison? It, is, have you worked with anyone who has substance abuse problems? Also, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. This is and bread and butter. Yeah, that, I, that is you know that is one of the things. I mean, our our nation is a nation uh, of punitive action. We do not do things to rebuild people. We do things to get control of them externally. One of the reasons I love theater is because it, it approaches everything internally and, and a person allows a person to have tools to change themselves and put their lives back together. And that includes matters of addiction as well. And there is, there is as much or more addiction inside prison than there is out. Uh, drugs are more available and cheaper in prison and people have access to them. So for a person to be able to break the habit while they are in prison is huge. And it's one of the things that I've seen over and over again. And um, yes, the, the serious addictions and yet it changed. And that's part of the change that's taken places in these people's lives, that when they come home, uh, they, and men in the film, I will say, um, there are people there who have made that huge transition as well. Coming home are, are really productive citizens and everything and have been clean and sober ever since coming home. And I'm going to use that as a final word for today, um, because I think it's important and um, very moving. And Brent, it's been terrific having you on today. Um, we're going Pleasure, to keep you Bob. a little bit, I'll probably keep you a little longer, because I think people in the room want to meet you. But I'm just uh, going to say a few final words to my YouTube and my podcast viewers out there who may or may not know us. Um, if you liked what you heard today, if you're interested in all the different ways the arts come into our lives. Um, if you're interested in theater itself or you're interested in, in anything connected with theater or anything that can, theater connects with, um, I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll be part of the community. Uh, if you wanna be here in the room and actually be able to, to meet the uh, speakers and, and ask questions and participate, um, I can make that happen. Um, just so you know, uh, just email me at trunltd at aol.com. That's trunltd at aol.com. And ask to be put on the Zoom list. Um, if, actually, if you if you email me, use Zoom in your header. That'd make me laugh. Use Zoom in a funny way. I like that. Um, so I also want everybody to know that we've been doing this as a community service now for 201 consecutive weeks. This is our 201st wow. consecutive show. Congratulations. Um, well, thank you, thank you, and I, I'm uh, I'm still amazed that I'm doing it, but uh, I love you know I love doing it. I love the fact that we've become a virtual um, 
meet we become a virtual program so that we can actually have people from outside of new york uh what what's happening uh, over the past four years is we've developed uh, i guess you'd have to call it a global audience since we have people coming in from uk australia singapore malaysia um, germany uh we've we've had people from all over the world so um, i'm going to keep doing that and i'm going to keep doing this as a virtual program so that i can engage all of you out there uh, even people that are not in the new york area um, we also welcome people for free because we started off as a, as a public service, really. Um, but, uh, we got bills. So if anybody wants to give us money, I wouldn't turn it away. Uh, you can come in, you can, uh, make a donation, make a small donation, make a big do donation, pay $8 to come and, and join us for, for an hour uh, on a Friday or join us a member. Um, and if you want to do any of that, you can also go to trudonate.com, trudonate.com, and give whatever you can afford. Um, putting together the schedules for the next couple months, and uh, hopefully I'll have things that will be of interest to all of you. Thank you for being with us.